Digital Music a Research Group at Queen Mary University of London, just not too far away from here. Uh, the research group is very large. There are about 100 people working on machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence, uh, I don't know, sound design, uh, audio engineering. And then there's us, the Augmented Instruments Laboratory. And we work with instruments, new instruments, studying existing instruments, studying performance, um, studying how people interact with them. And I've also uh, worked on Bella, which is an embedded platform for uh, audio and sensor processing. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to basically talk about what I learned from working on Bella that can probably, hopefully, be useful um, both on Bella and on other embedded systems. Uh, so first off, I would, as this thing talks about real time. Um, I'd be, I think it's important to, um, to go through what real time is, right? So a real, a real time system is a system that would produce uh, an output in a bound amount of time. Uh, so you, uh, and there'd be a latency between the time that the input comes in and the corresponding output is produced as the back, uh, as produced, is produced, and that's the latency. And the jitter may be this variation of latency, that latency is not constant, right? So uh, we normally deal with audio, so audio has a constant rate, which means that we have deadlines. We have deadlines that are, that are have a, uh, predefined intervals. Uh, it's real time, so we need to be able to produce an output in a bound amount of time, and that amount of time is the sampling interval, or actually the, the box size, I guess, multiplied times the sampling interval. Uh, right. Uh, but let me blue sky this. Uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about weather forecast. So say that it takes about 30 minutes uh, to compute the weather forecast based on whatever the current, uh, the latest data that came in. Uh, 30 minutes plus or minus 5 minutes because, you know, it depends what path your gradient, and the, your gradient and the sand goes down to. Uh, you need to, those need to be ready on time for the next weather forecast, which is uh, 12 sharp every hour. Um, would this be a real-time system? Uh, well, it definitely is, right? It's a real-time system, which has a sampling period of an hour, uh, has producing an output in a bound amount of time, 30 minutes plus or minus 5, let's say, it's, therefore, it's 35 minutes. And that amount of time that it takes to produce the result, despite it's a, a lot, because it runs on Windows 95, um, it's actually it's still smaller than the sampling period. So this is a real-time system, has a very long latency, a very high latency, but it's still real-time. I think it's important to, to, to remember this every time we talk about real-time uh, because uh, it's about the determinism and not about the, the latency being short. Of course, then we aim for lower latency than that. Uh, uh, well, jitter is the variation in the latency we said, right? So um, typically, when we have an audio system, we have audio inputs, audio outputs. The clocks, the input and output DAC, ADC and DAC are probably, hopefully, synchronized together. So the latency from the input to the output is probably constant. Uh, however, sometimes if you have stream coming in from different sources, um, then uh, that interval may not be constant. For instance, let's say that we have a, uh, a GPIO that we're reading, and that comes in uh, at different times in the, in the, in the, in the uh, block of, sample, of audio samples. Uh, unless we have a, time to, a way to timestamp that, uh, as it happens sometimes on some operating systems with MIDI, then we would get some jitter, that is, the response time to the impulse, or to the external signal, varies according to where in the, in the current block the signal came in. Uh, so, I'm also going through this because jitter and latency are used sometimes in this context that we're looking at just now, uh, with different meanings, right? So. Uh, the jitter is in the delay in response to an external action is something like that. It's probably a number of milliseconds. Computation time jitter is how much time does your CPU spend computing your audio callback. Uh, and, you know, there may be a, maybe your cache has been evicted by the previous process, so uh, it takes a few microseconds more this time than the previous time. Uh, when you, your thread is sleeping and you wake it up, that may take 
uh, non-constant amount of time, again, microseconds. And then, of course, there's a clock jitter of your audio converter, but that's probably down to nanoseconds. And that's not something we're going to worry about today, but the rest maybe, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, latency, if it's round trip latency, then it could be, it's normally a fixed amount. Uh, if it's action reaction latency, which we've just seen, then it's again in the order of milliseconds, and the trade wake up latency uh, is in order of a few microseconds. And that's something we go back uh, later in a second. Um, right. So when you do audio on an embedded platform, uh, you normally have these constraints. Like, so if you go for, a, uh, for one of the simplest microcontrollers, like a Cortex M4, then you have limited processing power, you know, 200 megahertz no SIMD instructions, but you can't do quite a lot, you can't do too much with it. So if you want to get more power, then you need a system on chip, where there's a one or more CPUs and some more peripherals, and then at some point you, you probably need an operating system. Now, if you have an operating system, then you need to fight against the operating system, the kernel, and the scheduler, and you know, interrupts coming in, uh, and, and then that's where the latency comes in again. And so whenever your time is ready, your audio is ready to run, when your audio callback is ready to run, well, maybe it's not quite ready to run for the operating, as far as the operating system is concerned. Maybe you have to wait a bit more. And that's something we really want to fight uh, when doing embedded uh, audio. Especially because if you sell someone a product in a, in a box, uh, they expect that product to just work fine, right? It's, it's, it's not your digital workstation, right? It's not Pro Tools where you know it's going to glitch. It's not your iPhone app. Usually it really expects no latency and no glitches because it's a black box, it's hardware, right? Uh, and yeah, this is in contracts with a mobile audio quality index, right? You've, you've probably heard about this earlier um, uh, during this conference. I, I just copy pasted some stuff from the Juice website. That's really funny, right? Uh, so in real world conditions, the receipt of emails of multiple applications right in the background can affect audio performance, right? Uh, glitchiness, the fact that there's an indicator for glitchiness tells you that, well, it's not working that great already. Um, yeah. So, when you're doing embedded hardware for audio, you probably, you should be, you shouldn't worry about, you shouldn't have to worry about this. If you do, then you probably have some bigger problems already. Um, uh, yeah. And then they give you a value of latency that, of course, doesn't include uh, the, uh, output latency due to a signal coming in over a BLE, uh, Bluetooth, uh, MIDI connection that may have 40, 50 milliseconds, you know, uh, for no particular good reason. Uh, I mean, no, that's not true. Uh, that may have their latency without any uh, fault on your side. But still, if you play something over Bluetooth, that's probably going to be a bit sluggish at the latest, at the least. So we developed Bella. You may have heard about that. We had a talk about it last year. Uh, and that sort of tries to address all these, all these problems. Uh, so Bella is a hard real-time system. We mentioned real-time earlier on. There's real-time, soft real-time, hard real-time. Soft real-time is your iPhone app, right? So it runs, runs okay. A mail comes in, glitch. Okay, that's soft real-time. No one dies. No one's using that for live performance on stage, are they? Um, um, that's okay if it's, not, if it's not audio, if it's manufacturing. Soft real time means, oh, well, okay, my machine didn't work properly, so I damage my product, I, I waste, I, you know, I lose some money, I need to redo it, but no one dies, right? No one dies, the performance is still fine. Uh, hard real time, that's what we're aiming for, is to, you know, just don't get glitches. And in order not to get glitches, you need to meet all the deadlines always. There's this, uh, what's that thing called? Uh, life threatening real time. No, with that La safety, critical. safety critical real time, great. Uh, safety critical real time, which is you know, uh, the, there's a, you don't meet the deadline, someone dies. Okay, we're not there yet. Um, meet all the deadlines always, and you do that by managing your priorities of what's going on on the board, uh, by being responsive, and basically in our case, what we did, it would be turn a computer running Linux into a single use board. Um, so we use Xenomai, which is. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, Xenomai is a sort of extension, if you will, to Linux, runs as a co-kernel. We'll talk about that a bit more later on. But the overall picture is that uh, Linux is sort of, um, um, that the audio thread runs first and Linux runs uh, afterwards if there's any time left. Uh, so with this setup, we can use a lot of CPU time. This was in my presentation last year, so that's my audio thread on a single board 
you know, single core machine taking 97% of the CPU. This was an SSH session into the board that would refresh every, every two or three minutes, even though it was supposed to refresh every half second. Um, uh, still, the audio was fine. I could surprisingly, perhaps, still play USB, uh, USB MIDI keyboard, uh, and that would still work, but uh, again, my, uh, I was using 97 of the audio of the CPU for the audio, and I was getting no glitches. Um, yeah. You, you can't quite go to 100%. You actually can, but you probably don't want to. But 97 is still fine. And until you get to the end, until you get to the, to the, to the ceiling, then you're not, not getting glitches. And of course, when it starts glitching, you're, you're just done. It just means you need a more powerful CPU, maybe based on Intel. Um, right, so Xenomon is a dual kernel uh, configuration. Well, I mean, it can be a dual kernel, can be a single kernel, but you, uh, we using dual kernel configuration. It's a real-time kernel that's sort of running a, a Linux thread among other threads. So there's your audio thread, then your secondary task thread, perhaps a core routine that runs every so often, and then there's Linux, okay? So it comes in three parts. The IPAC patch, which is about 10,000 lines of code, is a patch to the Linux kernel. There's a kernel driver that goes with it, and then a user space API to interact with it. Uh, um, you, yeah, when you have a task, I, I'll switch between task and thread because task is what Xenomai calls the threads and thread is what you, P thread calls the threads. Um, right, so a task can be in primary mode, which is Xenomai mode, which is the sort of high priority version of that, uh, or I mean high priority um, um, mode, basically. And then there's a secondary mode, the regular Linux mode. Of course, you want your audio thread to always run in, in, uh, in primary mode. Uh, now, this is an oversimplified view of what's happening, uh, but because there's, there's going to be a hardware abstraction layer and all uh, sorts of things, but this is probably enough for uh, the, what I'm talking about, also because it's not like I know much more than that. Um, there's an MS scalier down there. There's a Linux kernel over here with all the, the processes. Uh, at some point, you want a new process, or A, like A for audio, and so you go and tell the Linux kernel that creates a new process, and at the same time you create a new Xenomai task. Uh, and that task is the sh shadow of the Linux process. If you can keep it in primary mode, it will run uh, and will be scheduled directly by Xenomai. If you can't, then it will go through Linux and you're going to lose your real-time guarantees. Uh, the scheduler on Xenomai is a preemptive priority-based uh, scheduler, which basically means the highest priority thread runs first. Uh, you can have multiple real-time tasks with assignable, assignable priority uh, from 0 to 99, and Linux has priority 0. So you see they have plenty of space there to schedule your, uh, to manage your pri priorities, I guess. We're supposed to do something. Um, uh, and in principle, the load of lower, of lower priority threads of Linux does not affect the real-time performance, the performance of the real-time thread. Uh, that's in principle because in practice, Again, the CPU cache is not managed by Xenomai. So if the lower priority thread, you know, evicts the cache, cache that gets repopulated, then your audio thread will have to repopulate the cache. Um, and then there's this wake up latency that we'll see in a second. So last year I got this, uh, I got another, a different portion of the same image. And, um, um, Right, so you may have seen this before, but this is uh, from a 2010 paper that was trying out the, the wake up time of user space threads uh, on um, uh, BeagleBoard, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, so up here is regular Linux. And so this is the response time. Uh, and there's the number of, they kind of tried a few million times, right? Uh, so on regular Linux, your thread would most likely be awake enough to tell it to start in about, I'd say, 70 milliseconds, sorry, 70 microseconds. Uh, but, you know, you never know, right? Sometimes, a very small number of time, close to zero, it may take up to 350 microseconds, for instance. Uh, Real-time Linux is not much better, is it? Uh, Real-time Linux, it is better because, oh, I didn't show you this line here. This line here is 95% of the, wa uh, the wake-ups happen on this side. So yeah, 95% of the regular Linux, um, when you're in regular Linux, 95% of the time you're gonna get about 300 microseconds. 
On real-time Linux, you get a uh, preemptor T, you get about 150 microseconds, so that's better. On Xenomai, down here, not only you get 95% of the wake-ups in about 60 microseconds, but also your upper limit is here. So you're never getting more than 90 microseconds. So that's, that's, where your, uh, that's your worst case performance. The, the worst case performance in this case is, is, is off scale. Oh, and this was a very simple thing. There was a uh, that was sleeping, and they were talking in GPIO. That would probably trigger an interrupt, I guess. And they were um, triggering a GP, and then they were um, uh, writing to a GPIO from the from the thread that was that was being uh, awakened. Right. Um, so mode switches. I mentioned on Xenomai, you need your audio thread to run in the primary mode. Uh, so mode switches take place when the Xenomai thread. Um, requires some Linux services, right? And these are like disk input output, network, you're trying to print something, allocate memory, uh, thread synchronization, timing, messaging services, all those things over there. Now you recognize that many of these are actually, oh sorry, uh, many of these, are, uh, 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 many of these are actually things you would never have to do in an audio thread, right? So it doesn't come with too many limitations, right? You just need to be even more aware of, the, of those. Uh, this is not really relevant. This is how you program Xenomai. You can use the regular pthread API and pass some kernel, com uh, some linker flags. Uh, but you can also, and we'll see why we do it later, call the, the Xenomai services directly so there's no confusion of whether you're calling a Xenomai service or a, or a Linux service. Uh, just in case you're wondering about what, how this compares to preemptrt, I have not tried it, but uh, again, from that paper, which is a few years old, the response was that Xenomai responds faster. Uh, the, the sense I get is that the Linux performance overall is better with Xenomai because the average performance on Linux on preempt RT is, is worse than uh, on uh, standard Linux. Uh, there's this thing, most switches help with the debugging, which we may see in a second. Uh, well, this just means the preemptor T is more maintainable, and surely, if you don't have very tight re latest requirements, you, you should definitely consider that. Um, nice thing of Xenomai 3 is that once you write your code for the so-called Mercury, um, uh, sorry, the so-called Cobalt core, which is the actual dual kernel configuration, you can switch to preemptor T with the same user space code. Uh, not with the drivers, if I remember correctly, though. Um, Good. So, uh, what we want is to achieve real-time safe audio callback. So we should put nothing that could block there. Again, this, this is the basic recommendation of, of anyone uh, writing uh, real-time audio code. Uh, but then a couple extra things here, right? Uh, you want the CPU load to be constant. You don't, want that, you don't want one callback to take much longer than the other. And we'll see that in a second why. Um, and, and then this last thing. Well, let's see. Okay, so that's, again, good practice that you would know from primary school. Um, constant CPU load, it's always good practice, but that's something that is often overlooked because on most desktop systems, it's just okay. Uh, and this down th thing down here is, is more Xenomai specific. Um, uh, so, yeah, first thing we said, uh, you need to have code that doesn't block, right? Code that doesn't go and, and, and wait for the kernel to do something or finish what they, whatever they're doing and come back to you. Um, so, right, this is just in the wrong order. Uh, so on Xenomai, you can actually find out where your code is switching. You can find out where your code, when your code is not going through, the, through a real-time safe path. And uh, if you set that non-portable pthread set mode thing, uh, then your, your, cur your thread is gonna get the sig debug uh, signal every time a mode switch occurs. And then you can go, if you run this in GDB or you can use Slack, Slack spot to dump a trace of that, you can go and see where that code happens. So it's very good when you're porting a block of code, you just say, all right, it compiles, it runs, where is it going wrong? You can run, you can use this to, uh, to debug that. Um, right, measuring time. I really enjoyed the, the talk yesterday on, on debugging real-time audio, um, and I have something to add to it, that when you're an embedded platform, it's much more fun to use, 
uh, GPIOs, right? You can memory map a GPIO, access that in about 170 nanoseconds, as that's a toggling, you toggle it up and then down. In about 170 nanoseconds, I'm not sure why it takes so long, but it's definitely less than, than calling even the Xenomai real-time safe uh, clock get time. So that's a very good way of benchmarking your code, uh, as, assuming you have a nice scope. Um, I borrowed it from the electronics lab two years ago uh, for a week. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, I, I'll, I'll present some numbers later, not many. Uh, and that's how I, I got them um, searching for source. Oh, there you go. Uh, all right. So those three things I said earlier, uh, not known blocking operations in the audio callback, constant CPU load. Okay, that, that's a constant CPU load, even though the title doesn't say so. So say that we have our call, audio callback. I call it render because that's what we have on Bella, but it could be any of your favorite audio callback. And that calls at even intervals in time, right? Uh, so say they have an occasional expensive computation, like an FFT, for instance. Well, you know, anytime I have my 2048 samples ready, I'll just do my FFT. And look, there's plenty of, st plenty of time left. There, plenty of time left here, you know. So that's, that's, that's a good solution, right? Uh, the problem with that is that your average CPU time over there is probably about, I don't know, 35%. The rest of the time, the CPU is doing something else. It's, going on, it's probably going servicing some Linux stuff. But if you have that 35% CPU, let's, let's get to the ex extreme case down here, right? Let's say that your it, occasional expensive computation takes almost all the time that was left from your audio callback. Uh, well, then you're at the point where you having an average low CPU usage, but you can't really increase that because otherwise you're gonna glitch. You're gonna glitch every time you get your, your FFT done. So um, the ceiling is not 100% CPU. Don't just rely on whatever your, your CPU meter tells you, uh, whether that's, don't rely on whatever your CPU meter tells you. Uh, perhaps try to toggle the GPIO at the beginning and the end of that and see how much time is actually left and see if, if you're willing to take that risk. And if you need more CPU, then we'll see that in a second. But uh, it's not 100% CPU on average, it's 100% CPU on each audio callback, right? You need to be done every time. Um, right, let's say that I, you know, either in, increase, the sam uh, increase the sample rate or reduce the block size or just have a small, uh, small and less powerful board, uh, which is probably the case, you know, the case for all, all these three things. Uh, so you see now my audio callback is called more often. Um, I have my same FFT. I try to run it as soon as I have all the samples ready and it doesn't run, right? I mean, it does run, but then it overruns. So I have a drop, I have a drop out there, I have a glitch over there. Um, so what we would normally do is we put that in a separate thread, right? So if, we, if you manage to, uh, to get your expensive occasional computation, split over a number of callbacks, then you're probably safe, right? So in this case, we just put the, the FFT, in this case, or whatever computation, in a separate thread. Uh, we, our audio callback still has the same duration every time. There's no increase in that, so there's no glitches. You put in a separate thread, and the thread will run whenever it has time, right? So once, again, we're running this on Xenomai, so you can set the, um, you can set the priority of threads. So your audio thread may have priority 95, Linux is zero, so anywhere in between you can put your FFT. And uh, so as soon as your audio is done, with a small context switch in there, then your FFT thread will run and then we'll stop again anytime the, the audio comes in. Uh, and then the FFT will run again later on. Uh, perhaps at some point it's also gonna be done, hopefully before you need the, the result. And we'll get to back to that in a second. Uh, also notice that now, your average CPU usage is going to be the same as in the previous case. Oh, well, I mean, more or less, right? Um, it's going to be the same as the previous case, but uh, if you want to increase this, the, the amount of things you're doing to inside render, if you want to make your render larger, then the FFT will just take longer, but it will still, your, your render will still be glitch-free. Your, your direct path will still be uh, glitch-free. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's one recommendation. Aim for constant load in the, in the audio thread. Uh, for instance, you know, if we're talking about 
uh, small block sizes. Maybe this is more uh, um, something that more than just us are interested in. Um, if you're talking about 16 samples, 362 microseconds, okay, that's a sampling interval between uh, each call to render. Uh, and, and if this thing takes a few milliseconds, for instance, maybe, maybe because you also do some transformation there, then, um, sorry, not very good at this. Uh, then, yeah, you may have to spread that across uh, uh, multiple callbacks. Um, oh, another thing here. Uh, so one context switch, I measured it with the GPIO things, it's about 17 microseconds. I sometimes put this samples unit of measurements because we're sampling everything 44 kilohertz. So it's, you know, if you have 16 blocks, 60 samples per blocks, you know that you're spending 0.7 samples context switching. That's about 5% of your CPU time. Um, uh, so set it again, your block-based computation here, and you, you know, just put it on a separate thread, and they will take some time. Uh, so every time you go from your audio callback to the other thread, here there's a context switch. This context switch would happen anyhow, because uh, from whatever the system is doing before going to render, then the context switch here, context switch there. So you know, you may be effectively increasing the, the CPU load there. Uh, but if for whatever reason you were to manage to split out your expensive computation into something that's perhaps a block-based part and a sample-by-sample -sample part. Uh, I don't know, for instance, uh, maybe you're just doing an FFT and you want to do some pre-processing on the signal that you sent to it, or you tend to, uh, oh, it's a, listen to this, you have an optimized assembly function that computes the RMS value of a window, right? Uh, but that may require that your signal is already um, is already filtered, or, or you know, or or, uh, or you must have already taken the absolute value of that. So, so perhaps you can split that in two parts, right? One part of signal preconditioning, perhaps, and then the block-based computation. If you can put that that bit of signal or sample by sample computation at the end of each or, or in the middle of each of your audio callbacks. Uh, then that block base bar will take a tiny bit less, right? You're, in this case, you're saving a context, a one context switch. It may be that that gives you that extra five five percent CPU that you didn't know uh, you didn't know you had. Um, right. Let's see what's next. What am I supposed to make of this? I guess I need to press forward once more. All right. Oh yeah. So the problem with uh, block based computation sent to a separate thread as I just explained, uh, is that you're perhaps increasing the latency of that. Uh, so say that we're doing, this is the first case, right? Uneven load in the, in the audio thread, large block size. You do your render, you have the FFT. Let's say that you don't have enough time there to do anything useful. Well, whatever. At the beginning of the next callback, you're, you have the results of your FFT available. Uh, actually, in all fairness, if you really have time, you could have them in the same audio callback. So the FFT would take place in zero logical time, which may sometimes be useful. Um, however, if you split that over, over multiple threads and you have a smaller block size and stuff, well, then maybe, then maybe, maybe that will come in later. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, you're just going to be able to do it up to here and it's going to come in at the same time. You know, but it's, pro more, it's possible they will, come in, uh, they will come in a bit later. So threading may increase latency. Uh, I had this measurement here. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I had this measurement here again. There was a, basically a phase vocoder transformation. So that would take about 88 samples to run the, the FFT and the transformation and the, sorry, the FFT, the effect, and the, and the, and the IFFT. Uh, about 88 samples. Well, that means that, you know, um, you may be if you have a 16 sample block size, then perhaps you want to wait until like four blocks until you get the, the, um, uh, the result. Okay, so that's 128 samples latency. That's probably, that's perhaps okay, depending on your, own, depending on your application. Um, uh, but what's important if that, if, you're, if you have a sort of dry path in your, in, your, in your audio processing code, if you have a dry path that allows you, for instance, to, you know, I don't know, perhaps you're using the FFT for computing some filter coefficients. And 
you just want a dry path of your signal where the filters are, are being applied. Well, then you don't get that latency into the, the, the dry path, right? You only get the latency on the whatever transformed or, or in the application of those filter coefficients. So that, that could also be useful. And ultimately, uh, the result may be not uh, as bad, right? It comes in, if you have a smaller block size, that result comes in a while later. But the, um, I did this with very accurate measurements in Keynote. I split the I put the block here, and then I put this to make sure that they add up. So that's sort of realistic, okay? I'm not cheating. Um, of course, the alternative is to increase the block size and the latency of the whole path. Uh, and utilize and use uh, your CPU in a less efficient way. Uh, that is your 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 uh, thing out there. Uh, then on some systems, you may not, not even be able to increase the block size at will. But you know, in principle, if you have a Facebook order with a, a step of 512 samples, well, if you can make your block size 512, then you're just uh, th then you will have a constant load on each audio callback, right? Because you will have an FFT in each audio callback, and that's just fine. Okay, assuming, of, of course, assuming that your CPU can make it and everything. Uh, so this is sort of an exemplification of that. Uh, there's a box around the FFT tilde, but it's, it's just a reference to a, a random programming language. Um, right, so you, from your audio callback, you do something very cheap, which is put your samples inside a buffer which is called input here, and it's very confusing because that's an output for that, but an input for that, well, whatever, you need to call it something. Uh, so you accumulate the samples there, you're probably keeping, in track, keeping track of that, and somehow you can signal another real-time task and tell it, oh, the, the stuff is ready to be processed. At that point, the real-time thread will get the input, do whatever it needs to do, and take whatever time it needs to take. Uh, and store the results on the output buffer. Now, this thing of takes whatever time it needs to take. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you may have a, you will have a latency there. If you want to minimize the latency of the of the thread, then you may have to benchmark that on your on your platform and see how long it takes, how much uh, variation there is, and so how how early can you expect your results to be to be ready. You store the result back in the output buffer and then signal back the audio callback. At that point, the audio callback fetches the result. Now you see, what we were doing here from the audio callback is I'm just writing samples to the input buffer, fairly easy. Uh, here I'm just getting the results, again, fairly easy. Uh, the load of the, of the audio callback is constant because, uh, you know, you're probably, if you, again, if you're running a Facebook order, you're probably storing samples and reading samples the whole time. So that's a good thing. Um, next example. Uh, just look at it part for now. Uh, you have your audio callback. You have a network thread um, that receives some data from a GUI from a uh, network. Um, and of course, ideally, what you do is you just get a network thread, pull the network, and at some point, something's ready. Then it sends it back to the, through some real-time safe inter-process communication facility, it sends it back to the audio callback. OK, that's great that at least it doesn't block in the audio thread. It doesn't check for network in the audio thread, um, unlike some programming languages with boxes do. Um, uh, but what's the downside of that? Uh, I guess it depends what the, the audio thread is, what the network thread is doing, what, what sort of message you're receiving, right? Say that you're receiving a text message, like an, an OSC message, and that tells you to change one value. OK, that's great. So I need to change the, I need to change the gain of my, of my synth. That's lovely. So I'll receive the message here. I send it over here. Uh, oh, look, an OSC message. What should I do? Oh, let's parse it. OK, so you go and call, call parse the string, try to understand who that should go to. And at the end, you get a number, and you put it in your game. OK, that's very nice. But unfortunately, uh, parsing. Parsing may take time. I tried to pass a, me a message that was this long and took about 200 microseconds. OK, so perhaps, uh, perhaps that's another, re another way of perhaps unwillingly introduce non-constant load in the audio callback. So perhaps what you should do is pass the received message in the network, network thread. Okay? So all the things that are expensive and that are not happening every time, they should happen here. For instance, say that, that I was actually, maybe this was not a network, it was something else, and I was receiving a message for every audio callback. 
then okay, that's fine. I can keep it, I can keep it this way because I'm receiving it every time. But if I'm not receiving it every time, then it means that uh, I, it's better if I can do the parsing here, if I can do all the expensive stuff here, and maybe just send back a number. I put that in my gain and I'm sorted. Uh, Super Collider actually has this, uh, a, ve a very interesting way of dealing with this. It's bouncing the packets, uh, or an OSC message comes in and is, it gets parsed and gets sent to the audio callback that then can send it back to the Norio line thread and they could do back and forth a few times. So if that anything needs to happen in the audio thread, for instance, uh, okay, I'm gonna, tell me what, uh, what value, um, tell me the value of your analog input, okay, so I can, I can get it from here and I can send it back. And then perhaps this some, does something else and sends it back to me because it wants to do no, I don't know, the output, the input, for instance, uh, after a couple of blocks. Okay, then I'll send it back. And then the expensive stuff happens here, but there's a FIFO, there are multiple FIFOs that uh, go back and forth between the threads. Um, so that's, that's another interesting approach. Uh, so again, the, yeah, let's see, too many times. Okay, so aim for constant CPU load in the audio thread. Offload block-based computations to other thread threads. Uh, use thread priority. Again, with Xenomai, you have this large number of priority levels. You can set you have the same in, in, uh, link in preempt RT. Uh, and that's very convenient because these other threads, like our FFT, is actually a very important thread. If that FFT is not done on time, then we're going to glitch. Okay? Even, if it's, even if it's not the audio callback, it's another, it's another thread. If it's not done on time, we have a glitch. So those need to be real-time threads. And if you're doing, for instance, a partition convolution, where you have multiple FFTs running at the same time to do a, a quick and efficient convolution, uh, then you may have to use thread priority and get, make sure that the one that needs to be done first has a higher priority. Uh, and, and this is another generic uh, good practice. Do not rely on the block size of your audio callback for your DSP algorithm. Again, uh, the way you, when you first do an FFT, uh, when you first learned how to do an FFT, you probably just set an arbitrary block size. Actually, you probably don't even set the block size. You just say, all right, I have these many samples. Let me do an FFT in a block size, right? So you don't have to deal with accumulating those samples somewhere in the buffer. Uh, and then you want to change the, the, um, the FFT, well, you just, the resolution of the FFT, well, you just change the block size. Well, that's not, that's not often, uh, often how it works. So your code should always, possibly, uh, run the same regardless, regardless of the block size, okay? Of course, if you have input streams that don't come from uh, the they're not synced to the audio, then this could be a problem. If you have a GPIO coming in at an arbitrary time, that's, you know, uh, it, it will, as we've seen earlier, unless it gets timestamped, it will happen at the beginning of the next audio block. So, you know, that's, that's not quite always possible to, uh, not to depend on the block size for the, for the sonic effect, so for the, for the produced result, basically. Uh, but yeah, as much as you can do that, uh, relying on the fact that you have at least 64 samples, as we see, we'll see in a second, um, uh, it's, not, um, it's not always good practice, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, I think another good question is, is your task, as in not the audio callback, we know that the audio callback is a real-time task, but is your other task a real-time task? So a good question to ask here is, does it require Linux services? Uh, disk I.O., network, MIDI, messaging, again, various sorts of message queues or uh, uh, for accessing peripherals, DSP code. Does that mean I'm late? Um, so disk I.O. network are probably most likely Linux stuff, although you could write a real-time network driver if you're so inclined, and there's actually some implementation of RTNet that works fine on, on Xenomai. Uh, if MIDI is coming in through USB, well, unless you wrote a USB driver, in which case, uh, a real-time USB driver, in which case, please tell me, then, um, uh, then you probably, you probably need to go through Linux. Uh, unless, of course, you have a, some, some sort of real-time uh, in driver for serial or SPI that can read MIDI, mes can, can read MIDI messages, perhaps over a 5-pin uh, DIN. Uh, messaging, again, there may be some, there is some messaging facility for inter-process communication in Xenomai. Uh, um, but if you're parsing messages, then perhaps that's better. That may not be considered a real-time task. You know, if, if you don't know how long, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, 
if the message comes in always as the same size, you know, it takes always the same time to parse it, then perhaps that's a real time test. If it's not, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe if there's the various sizes or it doesn't come in every time, then perhaps that's not a, a, a real time task. Uh, peripherals can have real time drivers. I wrote an SPI driver, real time SPI driver for the bigger bone. The memory map GPIOs are uh, real time uh, safe. So they would could run on Xenomai. DSP code is for the most part uh, safe to run on Xenomai. I mean, I'd say I, I can't think of anything that wouldn't be. Um, so yeah, if something is uh, one of these things, perhaps it's, it could be that, um, again, on these only if you have a real-time driver, uh, perhaps it could be a real-time task and so you would run in Xenomai. Otherwise, you know, your network, MIDI, I.O., that's going through the standard Linux kernel, well, then that's, it's not a real-time test. You can run it with pthread. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and we'll see a couple more in a second. Yeah, text parsing. I don't know why this showed up just now. Uh, because it's also true that using real-time resources, again, message queues or, or semaphores or synchronization variables from a non-real-time thread, uh, has some overhead because the thread needs to switch to primary mode to use that resource and that can be I didn't I didn't time that but that's probably again about 17 microseconds I believe it's I think it should be the same as a context switch uh, yeah and there's some provided in real time to non real time interprocess communication APIs that would be good for these tasks uh, yeah I guess the other the other question to ask uh, as I mentioned a second ago is uh, is the messaging and the text parsing Will that take an, a, a predictable amount of time? Uh, and also the actions falling from the above, because if that's just sets again, that's probably fine. But if that's if that triggers some coefficient filter coefficient recomputation, that perhaps that should happen uh, in a separate uh, thread. Uh, again, and this uh, the consideration of whether a, a task is real time or not is what brought us to use manually uh, the rub p thread or the pthread API accordingly, whether we want to use a real-time thread or a non-real-time thread. So this way, you always have control. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, you could get the wrapping automatically from, uh, with a comp uh, linker option, but we felt that this is uh, safer, at least for now. Uh, I guess this is the last question, and it, does your code need to run that often? Uh, again, context switches are expensive, about one sample. Um, there was this, this thing in, um, oh, wait, oh, uh, sorry, I deleted the, I deleted the slide. Uh, so, because they had the same title, so I just thought they were the same. Um, uh, I could try to command Z, which is, would probably work, but I guess I can, I can uh, hand wave it. Um, so, does the code need to run so this often? So, say that your thread is doing network I.O., how often it does a message come in? Does it really, do you really have to sleep one millisecond and go back and check? Can you not do it a bit less often perhaps? Uh, the, in Zenoma, in uh, Super Collider there was this, the, the secondary thread, uh, that I don't remember what it was called, uh, was running every time at the end of the audio callback, right? So if you finish the audio callback and it says, oh, there was a synchronization variable, it said, okay, run the other, ta the other task. Um, and that task was processing message queues and see if, if it had to send uh, um, inputs and outputs messages. Uh, output messages. Um, okay, and, and when I was running that, it was kind of, yeah, it was taking all my CPU, right? Because it was running uh, with 16 samples per block block size. It was running very often, more than it would have, more than it would have expected. And, I'm, and that's, I think, is because many people assume that the block size has some sort of minimum value that is sort of reason, reasonable for some tasks. Uh, for instance, in pure data, uh, the network and disk I.O. is done mostly in the audio thread. Now, it's not my fault, it's there. Uh, it works great in many cases. Uh, I had to rip that out. But what's, what's even more surprising, perhaps, is that not only it runs in the audio thread, but it may run even multiple times for, even for each audio callback because it runs every time your blocks, every 64 samples basically, regardless of how long your, uh, your uh, audio block size is. Uh, and, that's, and that's, of course, doesn't have to run that often because you know, it may well be that it runs uh, three or four times in the space of a few microseconds. Uh, so yeah, I think it's always important to consider whether your task really needs to run, uh, to run that often. 
Uh, perhaps there was something else that I um, can't remember from my slide that I deleted, but that's all right. Uh, a few alternatives to run your secondary task that often is to, uh, I mean, again, because I found that this approach is pretty common to just schedule the task from the, from the or either run it in the primary, in the audio callback, or schedule it from the audio callback and inspect that to run every time. Um, the, uh, another consideration is that if you, it's not like um, if you want your test to run every time your audio callback is done, then uh, does it mean that that has to run every time? Does it mean that that's not thread safe? Does it mean that there's, there's something going on? Because if, it's, if it does need to run every time, then just put in the audio callback, no need for having that in a, in a separate thread. Um, so I think that these are three good advices, perhaps, to how to handle a secondary thread that doesn't need to run that often. You can have it free running. You know, just sleep five milliseconds, check again if anything came through the USB port. And you can block in secondary thread, you know, you just wait for the kernel to come and wake you up whenever, uh, whenever there's, uh, there's something new to do. Uh, and this is interesting. Check for conditions in the current thread and, only, and conditionally signal, signal the other thread. This, this thread in Super Collider, it was just going, you know, it was waking up and I was checking if there was five or six FIFOs, if they, any, if they had anything in there and then it would do something, right? Uh, so that, most of the time, that was just waking up for no reason, just to check those FIFOs and then go back to sleep. And, then, and that's where you lose a couple of context switches for no reason. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's another good advice, I believe. And that's the end. Uh, questions, my name, our website. <laughs> And I'll do this so I can see it's yeah, quarter to five. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not an expert in FFT, so this may be a stupid question. But I was wondering if you could take a large FFT block size, like 2048, and smear it over time by putting sort of um, uh, you know, uh, voluntary preemption inside of the FFT where it does some of the work, then returns. Yes, I believe yeah. that you could write or find a DSP library that does just that, right? So the DSP library would be, I don't know how we would call it, like split FFT perhaps, something like that. And so it may say, all right, I'm going to run the first few, however many blocks now, and then I'm going to stop, and then you can call me again. Okay, that's, I, I heard of that. I never looked for one or came across one. Uh, I believe that the issue there would be that if you don't tune it carefully, you may still you may go back in the in the in that situation we had uh, we had before, where you have an, an arbitrarily large um, um, uh, computation, and if you don't manage to spread it equally across all the threads, uh, uh, sorry, across all the callbacks, then you may get back to that problem. And also, if you do manage to split it evenly across all the callbacks, that may increase the latency of that. Because you're, you're taking the worst case, as, as I showed earlier, right? You take 88 samples to compute a 2048, uh, um, uh, 88, yeah, 88 samples to compute 2048 values um, FFT. And if you want to really sm split that in as many blocks as you need, then you may end up uh, having more latency. Your result may be ready later. So yeah, I think that's a doable approach. I think it's. Uh, it requires more tuning, and probably overall you're never gonna get down to the the, um, the threading approach that really takes all the CPU it needs until until it's ready to go. Yes, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, so I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, so you have Super Collided implemented now on Bella? Yes. Do you report it? Okay. And the other question is regarding the, this, uh, this kind of message passing in this Super Collider code that you showed yeah. between threads. So it's, if I understood correctly, you're, you're sending data and then just assuming that there's some data coming back. So you're uh, sending it back again. Not quite like that. So there's a, there are some FIFOs to communicate. So there's a, FIFO, so there's a network thread, I believe, that receives the OSC message and puts it in a FIFO, and that gets passed to the engine okay. and packets to engine. That's the first FIFO. And then you call stage one on the, on the packet. Now, this thing is called, what's that? SC sequence command. Not all of them are like that, but there's a number of built-in commands that are like this. 
And so they have different stages. You call stage one and uh, on the packet, which run, always runs on the real-time thread. Mm -hmm. And then you put that in another, whatever the result needs to be. You put that in a FIFO that goes, that's called M from engine and gets processed by stage two, which is, runs in a non-real-time thread. And once that's processed, whatever needs to go back to the audio thread, it goes in M2 engine that gets processed in the real-time thread here, stage three. That sends it in M from engine again. Uh, these are the same FIFO, but they set a flag to understand whether it needs to call stage two or stage four next. And it goes here. Uh, this is the, the, yeah, sorry, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, uh, the port of Super Collider uh, has been done by Mariah Bauman and Dan Stowell, and I collaborated to that too. And this in particular comes from a conversation I had with Mariah earlier this summer. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I have a question. Um, if, uh, if you want to use multiple cores, then does Inomai provide ways to say you have an audio callback? and you want to use the multiple cores to split your processing. So does Enomai provide ways to uh, do synchronization across real-time threads also? Uh, it does, yes. You can have multiple cores, and they, you can also assign, I think at compile time of the kernel, you decide how many cores will run real-time tasks, um, and then you can assign processes to those. Of course, it doesn't do, any sort of parallelization of the DSP code, that's, that's up to you. But you, you can manage multiple cores that way. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, are you familiar with uh, where PreemptRT has gotten to in its worst case latency and in its uh, comparison? No, I'm not. And I should have mentioned that earlier. Things got better since then. Uh, but I, I have no idea where, where it got to, really. Uh, I yeah I never I never benchmarked that. Uh, although now there's um, uh, there's a uh, there's a preemptor T version for the bigger one that I may test at some point to see to see how those compare. Any last questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.